Welcome to Unsilent with your hosts, Dave and Brian. This is not another current events podcast. We're digging deeper, diagnosing, and discussing what's really going on today, how we got here, and providing observations for future generations. Welcome to Unsilent. We're Brian and Dave. Let us know where you think we got it wrong or right, which you can do by going to unsilentpodcast.com. You can check out Rumble. They got a great comment section, Facebook, or other social channels. So let's get into it. What should we talk about today, Brian? Well, I think maybe the overarching story, as you mentioned a few minutes ago before we started recording here, of 2024 is we have an election coming up. It's uh, six months away as you and I are recording this, give or take. Mm -hmm. And it seems pretty clear that no matter what happens, we're screwed. That's about <laughs> it. Yeah, that's about it. And I, I don't mean that like uh, most people when they say that mean like uh, 350 million people. How can we choose these two? To, like, I, I don't mean it that way. That, that, I don't mean that. I mean, right. I mean, the 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 fallout from either one winning is going to be yeah. significant. And I have a yeah. couple things that will illustrate that. But first, I'll get your take. What do you think? Well, no, I think that's really true. I mean, it's when, when you have both sides saying that um, this this is this is potentially the last American election this because is, if, if a far side loses, democracy dies. It's the end of democracy. <laughs> We're democracy. going to end up in a dictatorship on day one if X wins. And you know, there, there, it's it's remarkable that. Uh, the rhetoric is about the same on both sides. You know, there's, it used to be yeah. people would explain, they'd say that, well, this is the most important election of our lifetime. Well, it, whatever election you're in is by definition, the most important election of your lifetime, because it's going to set the tone going forward. But the, the question now is, can the Republic survive whoever is elected? And as you mentioned, it seems to me that the, um, the question is not the policies of the two people that are running as much as it is the reactions of the people whose side does not win. Yeah. And, and then the counter reactions. So yeah, we're screwed. I, I heard a, I heard a reporter on, I think it was CNN say something like if Trump wins a year from now, I don't know if I'll be sitting here because, you know, we won't have a free press. And right. of course we won't have a, we won't have a white house press corps. And again, it's, it's laughable. Cause like yeah. I'm sitting there going, yeah, if only we had some way to have evidence as to whether or not he would get rid of the press corps. Hmm. How could we do that? Well, he Too was never elected before four years. Yeah. <laughs> and, and, and they said he wasn't going to leave office when he lost the election. And then, but then he left, so now he's going to come back and not leave this time. Like right. it's it, it's it's silly. So anyhow, I, yeah. I, kind of in the same vein as last week, I want to I'm going to first play this clip. I think one of the things that is un would have been unforeseen five years ago for sure, maybe even five months ago. I mean, this is it seems like a relatively new phenomenon. Joe Biden is losing the black vote like like crazy, right? Mm -hmm. And yeah. um, the evidence I'm going to show is not the same evidence that, that Fox News and CNN would use to show that. I'm going to play this clip for you that I, it doesn't matter who, what your politics are. I think this is hilarious. And so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to share my screen here for you. And I'm going to play. Uh, so, Dave, you know who Afro Man is, right? Everybody knows who yeah, Afro Man yeah, is. But yeah. you know who Afro Man is, yes, right? Yes. So he, I think he was like a one-hit wonder. Yes, uh, his exactly. song was But I Got Classic High, song. I think was the name of the song. Um, Classic. A classic. So I think that came out like 30 years ago. I think it was like late 90s was or something Was it that like long that. ago? It could be. I, 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 I don't thought. remember, but I, yeah. I, I'm, not a, a while back. I'm not an Afro man historian, so <laughs> it's hard for me to say for sure. But <laughs> I think it was late 90s. And uh, uh, for those listening who are around in 2024, you'll recognize the tune. My mom's going to recognize it. I'm sure she's heard it. And, you know, she, she was not in the... Uh, she was not in the hip hop scene in the late nineties. <laughs> so a very popular song, very yeah. well known. And he did a a remake, and I'm gonna I'm gonna play the remake for you here because I think it's I think it's pretty fun. Shout out to Bass Records. Yeah. Yo Hunter, yo Hunter. 
Roll up another one of them congressional blunts, brother. <laughs> Gonna get his laptop fixed, but Hunter got high. He wasn't gonna show all them dick pics, but Hunter got high. He should've let Hillary bleach his whole hard drive. Yeah, Hunter got high. Hunter got high. No. Hunter got high. Hunter got high. <laughs> the reason I think that this is so fascinating <laughs> is. You know, one of the things that I, I don't know what the I don't know the, the Marxist book. I've heard of it a lot, but there's like there's like tactics that Marxists are trained to use, and one of them is mockery, right? Yeah, yeah. You're gonna if you're gonna advance your movement, one of the things you want to get good at is is mocking the other person because nobody wants to be affiliated with somebody who can be made fun of, right? We right. we we don't want to feel stupid. We don't want to feel like we're we're inferior. Like we have psychological reasons why we don't want to be aligned with somebody who's who can be publicly mocked and like not really defend themselves. Right. Right. So this is kind of a new phenomenon though, where we're like president Biden and his, his son in this case are being openly mocked by a black man. Like this is, this is new. This is, this is a very different tone than we had 18 months ago where sure. you have, you know, you have the, the Larry, uh, what's his name from South central LA, uh, Larry, uh, Oh, that radio guy. Uh, shoot. Um, he ran for president for Larry Elder. Larry Elder. Yeah, Larry you've Elder. Him, yeah, yeah. And you've got you've got other folks like that that uh, um, yeah. that are very, you know, but they're conservative guys. They're political right. guys. They're yeah. they're, Repu- they're black Republicans who who don't like Democrats. And if it wasn't Joe Biden, they wouldn't they wouldn't like Barack Obama, for example. So, right. Right. That's different, though, than this. This is mocking the man. This is. Yeah. Making fun of him from a crowd and and a, and a cohort that's not historically like super political, right? In in the traditional yeah. like Republican Democrat kind of sense, like they all kind of hate, like everyone hates politicians. Like we we all have that in common, right? <laughs> the so they had that, but this is different. This feels like a change in tone to me. Does it feel that way to you? Well, yeah, it does. I mean, there, I, and I think some of it is, it, it does. It definitely does. And, and I think it's, um, people are, are, uh, are tired. One of, they feel like they've been used. They feel like they've been loyal to, uh, one side of the, you know, ideological aisle. And they don't think they've really seen a lot of benefit from that. So I think there's right. that. I think there's the this realization that they they did much better most most by any uh, you know uh, objective metric uh, minority folks of, of racial minorities of, of any sort did a lot better under Trump than they have under under Biden. Um, <clears throat> they see uh, also there's a there's a little bit more in in some communities of a. Uh, you know, recognition that the Democrat party has been very bad for families. And there's a lot of, you know, uh, you know, unhappiness about how the Democrat policies have affected the black community over the years. And so there's, yeah. I think all these things line up and they're saying, well, Hey, um, you can't just, uh, you, you can't just take us for granted anymore. We're not just going to automatically be there for you anymore, especially yeah. since we did better under that guy that you said was going to put us in chains. Yeah. I, I think that it's, uh, and again, I'm not, I don't, I don't live in Baltimore. I I'm not in the, I'm not in the, the downtown urban areas where this conversation is happening. So I'm just noticing what I'm seeing on things that become public like this. Yeah. There's a different conversation now about there's a different level of scoffing and mocking and like ridiculing and like yeah. um caricaturizing, like belittling, like it's again, this isn't straight up politics. This isn't like right. talking about tax code or and like culture. Yeah. And it but it's becoming it's become again, Afro Man's a one hit wonder from the nineties. So it's not yeah. like he's uh He's not, he's, he's not carrying the sway of like Beyonce or, you know, <laughs> no. whatever. Right. No. I, I, I get that. So I'm not, I'm not overestimating this. I don't think, but, but it's still, there's, there's more and more of this happening where, where guys who are kind of, you know, would have been in the eighties and nineties, the, the kind of hip hop crowd, you know, were very anti Reagan and certainly Nixon and like those stuffy old white guys kind of a thing. Yeah. Right. Um, 
and now like a, as it's evolved where um people in on the left uh are openly wondering like you know i heard uh katie kirk was talking to uh um bill Maher the other day a couple mm-hmm. weeks ago on his show and she was talking about how you know trump's people are like anti-establishment and like it's you know they're they're the fringe because they're anti-establishment i'm like the the people who were anti-establishment were was all the left all through the 60s 70s and 80s that's right <clears throat> yeah that's it's right it's completely flip-flopped right yeah and so the scoffing that was happening of nixon in the 70s and 80s is now beginning to happen to biden and right. i believe he's just the first domino right if you can scoff biden well the next person who comes along who shares his ideology not policies again i'm being I'm drawing a very right. distinct, distinction between Republican and Democrat policies and Marxist leftist ideology versus traditional Judeo-Christian value ideology. So Biden's just the first domino, though. So right. if Gavin Newsom comes behind him, I'm going to guess that Afro man and his friends are going to scoff and make fun of Gavin Newsom also. And e- even if it was somebody, a person of color, like uh, uh, um, um, Michelle Obama, you know, mm-hmm. people are talking about her running. Like, I, I don't know that she would be immune from this stuff. So my point is, like, it feels to me like this is the infancy of that kind of anti Richard Nixon that became the anti Reagan that became the anti Bush that became right. the anti whatever. It feels like this is kind of the beginning of that to me. Well, it is, and I think it's the natural consequence of the institutional capture that the left has had over the last 40, 50 years of all the major institutions. So one of the things that you could have said, for instance, in the maybe the 70s, for instance, is that, um, well, the, the problems in society are the failure of our major institutions to create a fair and just society, to create uh, equality, the, you know, what Martin Luther King Jr. Uh, uh, preached and talked about. So yeah. our institutions are preventing that. Now, the left is in basically full possession of most of the institutions, whether they're higher ed or even the corporate boardroom or all these things. But the problem still exists. The, the problems for people living their lives and and the disparities in in outcomes and all of these things still exist and so yeah. you can't really say that well it's just the you know the the rich white corporate people because guess what the folks that are in charge and have been for you know 30ish years as a general rule of most of the institutions have been those same leftists yeah. that were, you know, protesting in the sixties. And what is so it like Chicago hasn't had a Republican mayor since like 1928 or something like that. Yeah. <laughs> right. And, and, you know, and, and Washington state hasn't had a Republican governor since, you know, I had hair yeah. and I was small. <laughs> so, yeah. Know, so. yeah. So, so it feels like the same way that, that people were became like, they just kind of belittling and mocking, the Republicans in mm-hmm. the sixties and seventies, it kind of feels like that's beginning to happen culturally yeah. right. where it's, it's becoming um, anti-establishment to mock the, the left. And I think that's a, right. a huge change. So let's say Biden, my point with that is, is why I think we're screwed no matter what happens in the election is let's say Biden wins and the things that he's done and that that pattern again. I don't want to get into specific policies that they're easy to look up, and people, I'm not going to change anybody's mind on them who's listening now or ever. Uh, you either think they're great or not. I tend to think that they're not so awesome, but it, those kinds of things that he's done will continue to happen for four more years, presumably if he wins the election. Well, over those four years, there's been more mocking and more scoffing and more belittling and more ridiculing and more demeaning and and it feels like we will end up with a person or persons in charge that people really just don't think much of. Right. So it well, kind of feels like if Biden wins, that's the path we're heading down. Is, am I over, am I overstating that? Do you think? No, that's absolutely true because I think that, that if he wins, then he is, he's been pretty much beholden to the most extreme right. uh, factions of his party. Now, if he wins, it will probably, he'll probably, uh, you know, tack a little bit 
closer to the to center left than he does, you know, radical left right now. And that's because he can't run again after that. So he might yeah. move in. He, he might. I don't know that for I sure. I don't know how he could, Dave. Like I, I the <clears throat> one thing he's unified people on at one of the like last week we were talking about the college campuses um, and the the riots and protests and all that stuff happening. One of the things I saw Joe Biden able to unify people on was you had pro-Israel protesters there uh, and you had pro-Palestinian protesters there and they all ended up, they all ended up chanting F Joe Biden. Well, sure. There you go. So maybe he is the great unifier <laughs> after all. <laughs> he is the grand unifier, turns out, after all. He's the great so, unifier after all. <laughs> so well, my, my – I, I, I mean, the, the, my point with that is like the, the extreme folks that he's been seemingly catering to, yeah. he hasn't done enough in their mind. And I don't right. think he's going to have the stones to turn away from that. There's no way he's going to do. More it, it's that. possible. Well, in the, the question I think for, for Biden in particular is, is, you know, I, I don't, I don't think you can really say that the man wakes up every day with a bunch of great ideas and goes and tells people what to do. I mean, you know, he, I, yeah. He he's I, I don't know that I don't know that he I think he less and I don't want to overstate this because I don't want to be a conspiracy guy, but on but on the flip side of that, I don't think you could say that the man is running the show. <laughs> okay. I Yeah, I I, I, I would I would um <laughs> I, I would love to have like, you know, one of those man on the street kind of things where people who are like having their Biden, you know, their pro Biden kind of thing and say, right. you know, hey, which of you is like the wealthiest in the room or or, you know, whatever. And somebody comes in, they, they have like a, a million dollars in their retirement portfolio. And I say, OK, well, how about we let Joe Biden run that for four years and see what the response <laughs> would be? <laughs> I'm going to I'm going to guess that they're. Their interest in supporting him would diminish considerably if he if he was running their retirement portfolio instead of the entire country. <laughs> instead of the entire country, yeah, yeah. No, that's absolutely true. Well, and so right, and so. so that actually that actually then sort of mitigates my previous point, and that is a, a normal president in their second term would tack closer to the center yeah. than they did during their first term because they got to get elected again. The Biden presidency during the second term would not be a normal presidency because it would it would 100 yeah. percent from day one. It would be set up to get whoever is the, the next heir apparent going yeah. in 2028. So yeah. and, and get them to look like the hero for for reining things in and bringing them back to the center. I, I, yeah. I think that he would go full Marxist in some ways, which, again, to me, would lead to more people in in. um demographics that historically would not do this come out and be like very anti what he's up to. Sure. So my point with this is like, we're going to end up with kind of a, a, a thing where people just care even less about what he thinks or says than they do now, which seems hard, but <laughs> it's more of like, they're, 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 they're disregarding him in a very public, embarrassing, humiliating kind of way, which is yeah. new. That feels yeah. new to me. Right? Well, and right, it's so also it's, it's also inevitable because the man can't go two or three days without saying something that everybody's going. Yeah, he's uh, you know. Yeah, I he's, mean, for, he's, for every time Trump says something that infuriates people, Biden says something like, "I'm going to go talk to Ted Kennedy about this." Well, he's been dead I for said a while. Something, I, think, I saw something a couple of days ago as we're recording this that uh, it's early May as you and I are recording this now in 2024, and it said so far. The White House had the 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 press department or whatever, like the 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 people spokespeople, the White House press secretary or whatever. Right. Uh, they've issued 148 corrections for him what? this year so far. <laughs> so, all right. So, so if he wins, like we're heading down a path where people are mocking the 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 commander in chief and like disregarding him and like whatever. Okay. Then on the flip side, is you have. Okay, well, what if Trump wins? And then, and then we end up with this this uh, situation over here, where I'm going to play you a clip of Adam Schiff, who is a uh, he's a representative, House Representatives guy, and he's running for Senate. I think is that right? I think that's what his story yeah. is. Oh well, yeah, he's right. running for Senate. Yeah, he's been representative. Yeah, okay. So, so then I'm going to play you this clip here, and this is him uh, talking to a a. Uh, a reporter like a, it looks like it's in NBC News. Maybe it's like Meet the Press yeah. or something like that. Meet so here's, here's here's Adam Schiff. Congressman, let me ask you about this development this weekend. U.S. intelligence officials are planning to provide briefings for Donald Trump. 
once he, if he officially secures the nomination, despite the fact that he's facing 40 felony charges for his handling of classified documents. As the former chair of the House Intelligence Committee, do you think it's appropriate for him to receive intelligence briefings? Well, uh, the, that is the practice, uh, but we've never had a situation where one of the candidates for president has been so criminally negligent when it comes to handling, if not worse, when it comes to handling classified information. So I have to hope, and knowing the intelligence community as I do, that they will dumb down the briefing for Donald Trump. That is, they will give him no more information than absolutely necessary, nothing that would reveal sources or methods, because we can't trust that he will do the right thing with that information. He's been so reckless. So, yes, it does concern me. It is part of a long tradition. Uh, they will be wary of what they share with him. Okay, so on the flip side, if Trump wins then, now we have people in the opposing party, in this case, like openly saying, like, I hope they're wi the intelligence folks are wise enough to only give the president, the people, the person, yeah. presumably the population elects to run the executive branch of the government. We hope we, they kind of keep him out of things that are on a need to know basis because he can't be trusted. Well, because Brian, and, Brian, Brian, he, Brian, he might store that stuff in his garage next to his Corvette. Right. Right. Oh, well, well but, no, but, I, I'm sorry. That no, wrong guy. But, wrong, but guy were, wrong guy. But that stuff was in boxes, Dave. Like you're, 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 you're. I mean, come on. It was, it was safe. It was Bankers in cardboard boxes. boxes They're notably right secure. <laughs> so, so okay. So. If Trump wins, we have the opposing party. Like this, is, I don't know. Shifts probably in the top ten most influential people in the Democrat Party. Yeah, I guess I would scary. say. Um, <laughs> uh, here's here's this guy saying, "Well, I hope that the people in charge are smart enough to keep him out of the loop on things that he doesn't need to know." <laughs> so, so how can that go well? Like, how could that be? How how can we have any functional government? No, in a case where we're I, I get that, that listen, our, our country's full of history of disagreements and like people just dis disliking each other, hating each other's guts and things like that. But you put that stuff aside when you have 350 million people that are affected and like you start to run the the government, you start to run the company. You like well, you know? there, there, there has to be for a country to exist. There has to be a basic agreement on certain principles. One of the principles that is the bedrock of, of this country is it's a nation of by and for the people. In other words, the people get to choose who their leaders are. And when the people choose who their leaders are, that doesn't then go to a vote of the administrative state and different, you know, federal government departments to say, okay, the people voted for this person to be the leader, but what do you guys say? Do you want to, you know, do you want to uh, uh, countermand the people's vote? That's not how it works. That's how it works in <clears throat> the former Soviet Union or in Iran or in, in places where there is a, uh, you know, a, a class of people that essentially run everything regardless of what the people want. So <clears throat> you don't have to like the guy you're working for, but if you're working in government, you are obligated both <clears throat> by law and by basic, you know, ethics and American morality, if you want to call it that, to uh, do the things that the person that you are reporting to said, so long as it doesn't directly violate the Constitution that they all take a an oath to uphold. And and the Constitution as it is written, not not you you can't say, well, I don't like this thing. And so by my interpretation of the Constitution, I'm going to, you know, not do what the command is. So, you know, the, there's when you have that level of dysfunction in a government, you have a dysfunctional country. I mean, there's just no yeah. no two ways around it. Yeah, it, it reminds me when we were talking a few weeks ago about the blob and how the the new idea of like protecting, quote unquote, protecting democracy, which is like if you watch CNN and NBC, NBC and, and NBC News, like they're all the time talking about how if Trump wins, we're going to lose democracy. Right. And if you watch Fox <clears throat> News and you listen to to people like Ben Shapiro and things like that, if Biden wins, we're going to lose democracy. But but they're not talking about the same democracy. Right. The conservative folks are talking about democracy in the the vein that you're talking about, where where the the will of the people is what makes the democracy. Right. 
and protecting the the institutions that serve the people is democracy. Right. Where the new the new way that the the left looks at 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 um, protecting democracy and what is democracy is protecting the institutions. That's right. Um, and and so this is what Schiff is talking about. There is is like he's 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 demonstrating that that the institution of the the CIA or whoever he's referring to, like the intelligence community, they're the institution that needs to be protected, and they got to be right. protected from Trump. And and if he's because if he, if Trump's elected by these idiots who will elect Trump in his mind, like the the rubes that would put him in charge, well, we got to protect the intelligence community for, uh, community from that because yeah, that I, institution has got to be protected at all costs. And so these people are talking about how we got to protect democracy, but they're talking about two completely different things. Right. The the, the word has a hundred percent different meanings. In fact, it, in the in the Schiffian world, if you want to call it that, the the word is a perversion because it's we're told, and again, this is this is the arrogance of the administrative state, or as we've talked about with COVID before, the expert class, those that are the god kings that will rule over us for our own good, as opposed to the notion that we were given by our founders, and that is <clears throat> there is a collective uh, wisdom in the that's spread out among the masses and we need representatives, yes, to make it all workable, but that there is a, a choice that people get to make in terms of the direction of their country. Sometimes they're going to choose wrong, but yeah. it's better that the people have the opportunity to choose wrong and to make mistakes in a representative Republic. We're not talking direct democracy where one yep. person gets one vote on everything. Yeah. But yeah. It's better that people can, can make those choices than it is to indulge the danger of saying, we're just going to put a number of smart people in charge. We're going to do things, even if we don't want those things done, <clears throat> that, that danger is greater. And this is what Schiff and the others don't recognize because they're blinded by their own, you know, greed and power that, Yes, you have you have access to information I don't have. You have access to uh, resources that the people don't have. But it's only because we've entrusted you to be wise stewards of these resources that belong to us that you can do the things that you're doing. And as soon as you no longer are trustworthy to operate in a representative way, then by every you know definition of ethics and morality, you got to be out. Because that's when you get into that sort of um, more, you know, communist nation, and it doesn't even matter if it's if communist or fascist. It you get into a place where people are ruling for their own benefit, not for the benefit of the people. Right. Yeah, I think the the other thing that is noticeably different now than even again fifteen years ago, even uh, eight years ago, honestly, certainly different than fifty years ago is people who are running for president don't talk about having, they can't articulate a vision for the future. All, yeah. they, have to, all they can articulate is we got to stop the other guy. Yeah. And, and they will art, they can articulate very, very well the dreadful outcome that will be the result of the other guy winning. They can articulate that, but they can't, they can't articulate their vision for what they want us to become Right. They can talk about the mechanics of how they're going to do certain things. So we're going to allow drilling. We're not going to allow drilling. We're going to have a right. wall. We're not going to have a wall. They can they can talk about the mechanics of how things happen, but nobody's able to really say this is like our guiding principles. And right. and which I guess I guess you know like Kennedy used to talk, he talk, talk about putting a man on the moon. Like they he had a yeah. vision for things and <clears throat> yeah. and and for for decades or centuries even. We had the Constitution and the Declaration of Independence as our kind of guiding principles. But at this moment in time, half the people ish, you know, maybe a third to 30 to 50 percent, let's say, of the people in the country now think that those documents are archaic and useless. And like they're, yeah, that was, we tried that, it didn't work, or whatever their version would be. I don't know. Yeah. But we kind of had those things as like guiding principles. To, to tell us like what we were aiming for. And now we don't have any of that stuff. And so, so not only are we screwed because if Biden wins, we're going to, he's going to go, he's going to do things I would consider like more extreme, which is going to mm -hmm. 
further get people to not believe in the institution of the president and they're going to know that he's like not running things and they're going to they're going to do more like mock the office and like it'll yeah. just become a it'll become a weird like hollow office i guess and we'll just begin right. to accept that i guess <clears throat> if trump wins you've got these people who are like literally saying they're going to undermine him from like and, and we're like six months away from the election as you and i are recording now right and then on top of that nobody can articulate what they want all other than the stuff that the other guy doesn't want <laughs> right well and see you take take kennedy and reagan within a generation of each other uh both men called on the spirit of the American people and, and basically said it was a great thing. We're going to commit ourselves to put a man on the moon and do the other things by the end of this day, decade. Reagan yeah. said, I still see America as a shining city on a hill. Both statements are statements of belief and trust in the American people, in the American dream, in the wisdom of the mass <clears throat> of, of Americans, in our belief in freedom and those constitutional values that form the country. Both people now who are running for office, I'll just be, I'll just be down the middle in this. You know, Trump says, I'm the only guy that can do it. I'll end it. I'll end the Ukraine war yeah. on day one. I'm the only guy that can do it. Biden says, I'm going to forgive your student debt. I'm going to, I'm going to do this. I'm going to, you know, raise taxes on the rich so you can get back to those evil rich people. It'll be more than it's ever been. Before. You know, both people. And, and this goes to the appetite of the American people. If we wanted, you know, what, if, if the American public wanted what I want, what I want is somebody to come back and say, no, we're, yes, we face lots of problems, but we are Americans. We can solve these things together and we can be a better country in four, eight, 12, 20 years than we are today. All we need to do is commit ourselves, recommit ourselves to these basic principles that the nation was founded on. And we need to put aside some of this other bickering and say, we're going to go get this thing. We're going to go do it. We're going to, you know, you, you, you work with business owners all the time, Brian. You, yeah. Part of leadership is inspiring people to do more than maybe they think they can do or to do more than they've ever done before. And that we don't have that kind of, of leadership. We have sort of self-serving leadership in, in, each of these scenarios. And so that's part of why everybody is depressed about this election. Well, and I would say we have fearful leadership. You know, we, we, Biden can't say anything about anybody no. that, uh, I mean, he'll, I mean, he, he has to walk on eggshells on everything. Right. It's crushed. It doesn't matter who he tries to appease. And he's, I would say he's very much been an appeasement kind of president. Oh, absolutely. And no matter yep. who he tries to appease, he's pissing somebody else off. That's yep. 100%. And Trump's got – Trump is – he knows he's fighting, like, the institutions that are supposed oh, to yeah. support the government. Yep. They're, they're, it's being – I mean, there's more information coming out, I would say, weekly now at this point, regularly, though, for sure, of specific things that were done while he was president. Oh, yeah. Where they just flat out undermined him and, Outrageous. like, lied to him and, like, hid stuff from him and, like, th things that you're like, this is – it's it's a wonder things went as well as they did, and there were yeah, some things exactly. that, that weren't that weren't awesome for sure, right? So, it, so he's kind of um, speaking from a place of fear, also like he can't he can't say yeah. what he really wants to say because right. if he said what he really wants to say, like he probably wouldn't get elected, right? So yeah, yep. so but this is again this is this is kind of unfamiliar. Um, it it we've we've had people who even though they had opposing points of view, they would articulate a vision. They would they would positive they, vision. They, yes, they would. They would Po yeah, they would give you positive reasons why to do the thing. That's not what we're seeing. Right. We're seeing people who who only articulate the negative of the other what the other person wants. Then right. you throw in RFK in the middle of all this stuff, <laughs> who's like, you know, the most viable third party candidate we've had in that you know recent memory for sure. Yeah, since Ross I, I think Perot. Last night he's pulling at like ten point two percent. Yeah, yeah. And and um, I think he has done polls significant, like big big polls, not like twelve hundred people polls, like. 200,000 people polls where he beats um, Biden head to head. If it's just those two, he wins like in a landslide and he barely beats Trump according to his polls. And I don't know who did it. I don't, I don't know, I, whatever, but point is, um, but he, <laughs> the he, he was a Democrat for like his whole life. His, his dad was his entire family. Yeah. Kennedy for crying out loud. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> like, so, He's like shunned by the entire like 
Democrat right. Party. Like there, right. there's lawsuits to keep him off the ballot. There's they're fighting him his his mere existence in this race. Right. And he's not like doing like a again, 10% is nothing to scoff at. Well, no, I mean, you, you know, like you say, the, the last time we had anybody, uh, you know, competing at that level was Ross Perot in 92 Perot. with yeah. his charts and graphs and stuff, yeah. if you remember all that. Giant um, sound. That's right. Yeah. I'm going to tell you, I can, I can do a great Ross Perot. Um, I, I saw that. Yeah, I, I noticed that right <laughs> off. <laughs> but you know, I think one of the reasons that Kennedy appeals, uh, because, I mean, everybody knows on the Democrat side that, you know, Biden is not authentic i mean he's just not authentic whatever you want to say about about kennedy and most of kennedy's policies are not my policies they're they're you know i i don't i don't go along with him on the abortion issue there's but but the man is honest and he's authentic from what i can tell at least Uh, dave i heard him say something i don't think i've ever heard a politician say ever he said yeah i used to think that and my views have changed on that (laughs) <laughs> yeah, you know that that is incredibly appealing. That yes. I mean, you know, I I heard him I heard him talking to uh, Ben Shapiro about abortion, and mm. um and he laid out he didn't lay out a case of why you know he, he didn't make a traditional case about abortion, but he made and what sounded to me like what he honestly believed now i disagree with him i yeah. you know agree with ben on that but at the at the same time he laid out uh a non-hyperbolic case Argument, of what yeah. he believed and you know it, americans are just we are panting for somebody who yeah. doesn't uh just lay out the this tribal you know, uh, say what you want to say, what we want to hear kind of stuff. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Somebody who's not pandering, somebody who like legitimately has a belief in a thing and has a belief because they have a vision of what, what success could be like. And like, why we'd want to do a thing and whatever. Right. And, Um, and that, and that respects us enough to tell us what they think, regardless of the outcome. Yeah. And I think that that might be the part that is, not allowed in the current Democrat Party. No, no. Is you cannot respect oh, no. the, the, the voters. You you have to prioritize the needs of the institutions. Yes. The intelligence community, their needs have to come first, and right. then uh, we someday we might get to the people and what they need after we figure out what's in it for the other folks that are uh, well, in the hierarchies and, well above. And you can understand that because they spent forty, fifty years after, say, Eisenhower involved in the process. I mentioned this before of institutional capture. They spent out. They 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 spent a lot of energy for decades working on you know making sure that all the major level levers of society were in their hands, and so they have them now. And so when you when you spent half a century doing that, you're not going to let that go, and you're not going to let the rubes that you know, are in kansas mess that up for you um yeah. just you know as a matter of power politics so right. you understand why it, why it is it's wrong but you understand why it is so we're in a in a time where the the sitting president is being mocked more and more by people who culturally would never have done this before mm-hmm. you have um the the president another candidate who's who's got you know presumably is like leading in all the polls right now that if he wins like the 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 swamp or whatever like the the bureaucracy is going to work against him like that's that's yep. becoming very clear yep. and then you've got a guy who um does seem to again whether you like his policies or not is is a breath of fresh air for most americans probably in that yeah. at least he's sincere at least he's genuine right. um he 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 understands like you can change your mind on things like you can yep. you can learn things and improve uh, your your point your education level on things and your point of view might all, might might change based on those things, but he's not allowed to be a player because right. DC doesn't want that. Yep. And so it just it feels like again we're we're six ish months away from this election. It feels like to me, no matter what happens, the next day the country is going to be in worse shape. Not because of who the president the elect right. is going to be. <clears throat> not because that I think if if. Again, I have strong opinions about like if if we get four more years of Biden, he doesn't have to worry about getting elected. Like like the reins are going to come off, and like oh, who yeah. knows what that guy's capable sure. of. If Trump get, you know gets elected, um, so it's my point is it's not about the policies though. What I'm saying is whoever wins, the other side is going to have um um 
reason to just unleash holy hell. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, you, you, well. So first of all, you know that whoever wins, the other side will claim election interference. It it doesn't well, matter. I thought that was not allowed. I I, I mean, I thought no, that, that it, was not. It's a, def, well, you heard that Stacey <laughs> Abrams is the uh, legitimate governor of Georgia, not Brian Kemp. Yeah. He didn't he didn't win. <laughs> Hillary who said that you know Hillary should have won because Trump's an illegitimate president. We've heard that he's for illegitimate. Yeah, 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 I mean, yeah. so <clears throat> and the, then there's studies that that say that the people's belief in the integrity of the election depends on whether their candidate wins or not. I mean, there was, I think it was, I don't remember which, which university, but, but all the evidence says that if, if Trump wins, the Democrats will say there's election interference and they will deny the election. If, yep. if, um, if uh, Biden wins, uh, Trump uh, will say the same thing. Yeah. So you both, but it will happen either way. That will happen yeah. either way, which will further under, undermine one potentially, you know, relatively solid institution in our society, or, or supposed to be at least, and that's elections. So <clears throat> whoever starts will start with a hobbled, a further hobbled uh, system that they're supposed yeah. to work within and govern. Yeah, I mean, I think I look at like, you know, the, 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 the press corps currently that follows Biden around the white house press corps and like just watching like CNN and NBC and ABC and CBS. And, you know, I, I forget about like the, the, the further left ones like MSNBC, forget them for now. Like just like look at NBC news. Yeah. You know, I, I, when I grew up like Tom Brokaw was the guy, like he yeah. just like, he was unassailable. Like if that guy yep. said something happened, that's that thing happened. Right. Yep. And the, the press has been so, kind <laughs> and forgiving of biden and oh, you yeah. know <clears throat> the day that if trump wins you know they're just going to be merciless with they're gonna yeah they're gonna do the same stuff that they did before where like yep. the guy could barely get a sentence out without them like talking down to him like he's a toddler and like right you know like okay so you got that and then on the other hand if biden wins you got you got four more years of the press not investigating sincerely any kind of like real right. malfeasance like it, right it, it, it's no matter what, whoever wins, for the first time in my life, I believe this. I don't think I ever believed this before this election. And again, everyone always, this is the most election. Okay, well, forget that stuff. I didn't feel when it was Clinton and and H. Ross Perot and, and uh, George Bush, I didn't feel like which, if any of them won, we'd be worse off, right? right? I didn't feel that way with Bush Gore. I didn't feel right. that way with Obama and the two guys, McCain and, and yep. Romney. Like I, if they win, like if, if my guy doesn't win, like we'll be fine. I, yep. Now <clears throat> I feel like no matter who wins, it doesn't matter the day after the election, we're going to be worse off. Yeah, I think that's true. I think that's true. And that, and that just gets back to the only way that, that we get back to the kind of America that we remember or something similar to that is if and when we go through a serious crisis that unites yeah. the people. It's the only way. There. So the, the other thing that's important about this election and about what we're talking about right now is whoever wins – it cannot, it's not going to fix things. If you're on the left and Biden wins, it's not going to get any better. If you're right. on the right and Trump wins or, you know, populist and Trump wins, it's not going to get any better. Right. There, there will be, you will have certain policy victories here or there. Sure. I, you know, I don't want to see Biden's crazy tax plan go into, into effect, you know, no. so, so there'll be things, there'll be little things here and there, but yeah. overall societal, uh, you know, functioning and cohesion will not improve even if the person that i want to win wins if there was you know yeah. the perfect person was running <clears throat> it's just not going to happen yeah so it feels like um the people the candidates are are i wouldn't say irrelevant but their relevance has been mitigated for sure and it feels like we're just we're just inching towards this moment in time yeah. where one side is going to have all the reason that they need to do with the things that they really want to do. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it's, you know, if you, if you want to think of it in terms of sort of the, the tides of history, the, the way it seems to me, uh, an analogy might be that, you know, you've got, you've got two boats that are sitting on the, on the water and one of them's got your guy and one of them's got the other guy, but the tide's going out 
yeah. whatever wh- wherever they move in their boat, the tide's going out. And and so yes, it matters where you sit in the boat because maybe you won't be swamped first, <laughs> maybe you'll be right. swamped later. But but the, there is an inevitability to these cycles of history that you and I have talked about so many times <clears throat> that say that the that one person cannot change the the overall you know societal direction it's right. sadly not not possible yeah and then you throw in the international woes and you throw in the the uh you know the fact that that our government for the last you know 70 years just hasn't ever seen a war that they didn't love you know right <laughs> uh you start throwing in these other things that that are real sub substantive and yeah. it it's it's hard to uh, again i i you know, I'm, I'm envious of the people in 1961 listening to Kennedy talk. I'm envious yeah. of the people in 1984 listening to Reagan talk. I'm, I'm envious of how I was in 1992 listening to, to Clinton talk. Even though yeah. I, you know, I would say he was, in some ways, he was a, fa- a great president. Otherwise, he was not such a great president. But at least it was, we felt we had that we had the fe- at least I experienced having the feeling of like hope and yeah. a bright future and and all those things. And that all that is absent here. There, there was national pride it, it, in those days. There was yeah. in, in, you know, I mean, I, I was, I was alive for six months when Kennedy was president. So just a very small time. I shared the earth with yeah. him, but you know, in, so you were, you were alive in a period where there was no color TV. That's awesome. I, I was. My first TV was not a color TV. I I watched it a little tiny black and white. It well, was... I wonder if they made color TVs after 1961. But I but like you were you were live at a time where you didn't have a choice but to have black and white. Well, TV, yeah, right? TV was a and it wasn't TV then. It was television. What are you talking about? Television, TV yeah. came around in the 70s. <laughs> <clears throat> Abbreviations came around. Man, I feel old. <laughs> but you know, during most of my lifetime, even though I I remember as a teenager arguing with a friend about about jimmy carter about you know should jimmy carter win or should ford win you know and and i I remember those political discussions happening right and but regardless it was about well he's gonna do this and he jimmy carter's gonna give away the panama canal i remember the arguments i was making jimmy carter's gonna give away the panama canal it's gonna suck he shouldn't do that but i never believed and and by the way i was right yeah (laughs) but but the, I, I never believed that the country was fundamentally, you know, uh, in, in a spot where it'll take a crisis to, to uh, allow the thing to reset itself. I never, I never believed that yeah. until recently, until very, re- very recently. Yeah. I also think mm-hmm. that, that uh, I don't think I'm alone in this feeling of like, uh, again, I wouldn't call it hopelessness and despair. I wouldn't quite go that far, but it just feels like we're on the precipice of things getting worse before they get better. That's yeah, kind of what I agree. Like me, right? So, <clears throat> yep. but I also think that collectively we can only take so much of this. And I don't think I'm alone yeah. in feeling this, like things are going to get worse before they get better. I think everyone yeah. kind of has that sense that not yeah. everyone, but many people kind of have that sense that it's going to get worse before it gets better. But I don't believe that collectively we can stay down and like, just like wallow in this for like decades. I don't no, think that's no, possible. I don't think, I, think that, that, I don't think so. There will be a point where people say, Enough of this. Yep. We're pulling ourselves up by our bootstraps and coming and and somebody will emerge, a group will emerge that does have a vision, that does paint a picture of hope. And and you know, the the um the blob and like all the cynical bureaucrats in DC won't be able to to hold that down right. because people just will get tired of living like this. They're, yeah. Having having optimism and hope and pride and all those national pride and all those things. It's too re. It's in too recent a memory. Like, like yeah. you would have to, you know, China did it. I guess so. It's not like out of the realm of possibility to to scrub that from from the society. I guess, but it it seems like we have a a unique outlook where we kind of go through these periods, but then we just have enough of it. Like, okay, well, yeah, this is really this really sucks, but like, okay, let's rope our sleeves and like fix it now. And I know. I don't. Yeah. I think that feels like a more uniquely American thing than other cultures maybe have had. I think for the most part that's true. I think uh, our it's sort of built into our DNA, being a country that was formed from a rebellion from a uh, a, a bunch of scrappy people. So I I think that American personality is still there. I think you can also look back to other societies in history where there was a certain amount of of pride. There was a pride in being a Roman citizen, and you know Rome and 
its various forms lasted for about 1200 years. So that, yeah. you know, it, it had lots of ups and downs, you know, you had invasions and lots, lots yeah. of challenging things, but there was a, there was a thing about being a Roman. I think that's sort of the closest uh, analogy that I can think of yeah. to <clears throat> the idea of, of America. Uh, although, you know, our founding and our, our, you know, ethos is a, a, a superior ethos in terms of, of just philosophy and Western philosophy and such. Yeah. But, but uh, so I, I do think that that, that kind of, we've had enough and we ain't going to take it anymore. They'll roll out well, Twisted and, Sister and, and here we is, go. Yeah. I'll Twisted Sister. And, and it's funny that you mentioned Rome because uh, for every, you know, Marcus Aurelius and every Julius Caesar, you had a Nero and a Caligula. <laughs> oh yeah. Well, yeah. Well, see, there you go. But you know, and see, this is the interesting thing about Rome, I think, because, because, you know, you, you had the, the, the philosophy of Marcus Aurelius and, and which was, you know, exalted and worth reading today. Um, yeah. But then you had, yes, you had Nero's and Caligula's and crazy people, but the Roman, the Roman empire still survived right. in one form or another. So there was something, there was an underlying thread that uh, allowed it to continue on even yeah. through those hard times. <clears throat> and that, and that's kind of my point is like, you know, for 1200 years, like for every awesome person we remember, you know, yeah. 2000 years later for really great reasons. There's, there's just as many people we, re we remember for really bad reasons, but the empire endured, the empire sustained. They, they, the people, you know, of course had ebbs and flows of how happy they were and how fulfilled they were and how optimistic they were, but for sure they, they endured anyway. So yeah, exactly. And, I think that that again, uh, um, this is uncharted territories for us. It feels very unfamiliar in these ways because our generation just hasn't experienced this stuff. But I also feel like it, it can only go on for so long, and we will have right. to come out of it. And so I'm yep. looking forward to that part, as I'm sure Me everyone too. is. And uh, um, I'm enjoying this summer before the election happens because I do think it's going to be a much brighter summer than it is uh, in 2024 than it's going to be in 2025. All <laughs> will be interesting, won't it? <clears throat> <laughs> right. All right. Well, hey, if you think, you listening, think that me and Dave are, are misrepresenting what's going on and you have a different perspective on how things are and you think we're completely screwed up, please come and tell us. The Rumble channel has a great comment section. Or if you think we're right and we, you couldn't have said any better, we'd love to hear that too. We want to we um, illustrate to people in the future what this moment in time is like. And we certainly want to do that from more perspectives than just Dave and I's. I mean, Dave's really smart, of course, but he can only, he can only cover so much of this. We need your help as well. And uh, so again, unsilentpodcast.com, the Rumble channel has a great comment section, a great place to do it. So until next time, this is Dave and Brian signing off. See you next week. Do you want to be unsilent? Make your voice heard on our social media channels and share where you think we got it right or wrong. Go to unsilentpodcast.com for social links so you can join the discussion. 